Today on Rebel Then King, we are going to take a look at all of the number crunching that we do in Pathfinder 2nd Edition and ask ourselves the question that frankly we are all too afraid to ask. Does every plus one actually matter? Welcome adventurers. In this game, in this community, we love the math, the data, the science, the charts of everything that goes into calculating what your character can do. It seems like a lot of our content focuses on this, but I question whether we should. We have the phrase, I think it's attributed to the rules lawyer originally, every plus one matters. We love our proficiencies and percentage chances of hitting. I do it a lot. We all do. But to be honest, I don't always fully buy it, and I think that we focus on it a little too much. I want to talk about why I think that, and I want to talk about what we can do about it. First, just to get out of the way and be super, super pedantic. As soon as a single plus one does not matter, the sentence every plus one matters is incorrect. So no, absolutely every plus one doesn't matter just on the grammar of the sentence alone. In fact, I would say only somewhere between five and 10% of the plus ones actually do. Why between five and 10%? Well, most of you know already, so I'll go through this as quickly as I can. Quite often, you're going to need like an 11 on the die in order to achieve the thing that you need to achieve. Well, if you get a plus one, then that number that you need on the die goes down to a 10. You still can't get a critical success unless you roll a 20. So that means your plus one has made a 10 viable rather than an 11 being viable, which kind of means that the 10 is the only number on that die where that plus one matters, and that one number on the 20-sided die is a 5%. And then of course, on the 10% end of the spectrum, if there's something where you originally need a 10, but now only need a nine for success with a plus one, that also means you need a 19 and not just a 20 for a critical success. So now there are two numbers on the die, a 19 and a nine, where that plus one would come into play. But of course, two numbers out of that possible 20 is 10%. So yeah, the average of how often a plus one matters is going to be between five and 10%. I think if you are up against a lot of lower level challenges, lower level creatures in your encounters, it will be closer to that 10%. If you are up against a lot of higher level creatures, it's going to be closer to that 5%. Okay, so enough about just ripping apart every plus one matters just purely on the semantics. And as a side note, I am being super pedantic here. And I actually like the phrase and the motto plus one matters quite a lot. And I do like the rules lawyer a lot. I think he's a pillar of the community and a fantastic human being overall. Uh, but if you wanna make some like D&D &D YouTuber style clickbait about how he's totally finished now, I, I guess go for it, you know, send me the link. And now the so what. The bigger point that I wanna make here is that I think we sometimes focus too much on what the math says on paper and not how it actually pans out at your gaming table. It's hard to show someone numbers on paper, show them distributed results and all that kind of stuff, to disprove what they are actually experiencing in real life or in this fantasy game. Because numbers on paper, charts, kind of lack context. And context is why I started this channel. So the context I wanna provide here is that all of your big, beautiful bonuses don't actually matter as often as you might think. And that's because I don't think your bonuses, your plus ones actually matter until you are rolling often enough to achieve average distributed results where you can see those bonuses actually nudging the scales in your favor. If you roll only two or three times, let's say, and you have a plus one from, you know, some from bless, let's say, but you roll a two, two and a three, none of that matters. If you roll several hundred times with bless, well, now you're going to see it coming into play. Now, I'm not a statistician. I can barely pronounce or spell the word, but I did try reading up on the central limit theorem, huh? which is kind of explaining the concept that I'm trying to go through here of the sample size needed to achieve average. And it kind of says it's about 30 for most experiments, but also I read that's a complete misnomer and not always true. I would guess it's closer to like 50 D20 rolls to achieve average on your D20. At any rate, I rolled an actual physical D20 100 times and stored the results just for you. I'm not gonna go through it again here, but here are the results. They were terrible. I recorded results in groups of 10 and in only two of those groups of 10 did I do better than the expected 10.5 average. 
and on the total of 100 rolls, I have a 9.6 average, less than the expected 10.5. I did roll a 10 six total times, so using that previous figure of saying you need an 11 to normally hit and therefore a plus one would help out a 10, that actually would be 6% of the time where a plus one would have mattered. So clearly even in a 100 rolls, you're not going to be perfectly average. And if I built a character, let's say, with an extra plus one built in, I wouldn't be achieving extra results on that grouping because I was almost exactly one point below average. I would get myself back to average with that plus one, which is kind of not what you want to see when you were investing extras into making your character better. So now the question is, how often do you actually roll in this game? Well, let's go with combat encounters as an example here. I think generally you're going to roll about one and a third times per round. You know, sometimes you'll attack twice, sometimes you will move, attack, defensive action, sometimes you might do a debuff, like an intimidation, and then attack, you know. And then maybe combat usually lasts about three rounds, I would say, so that's about four nice rolls per combat. Uh, and then if you figure that, you know, you're only gonna be doing maybe a few combats per session, you're gonna be somewhere around like 15, 20 sessions, which is probably gonna be seven or eight months before you start rolling average. So in the end, you're looking at months of playing to achieve average distributed results which is not going to feel like average distributed results when you are in a slump week after week after week. But I know what you're saying. You're saying you use the dice for more than just rolling attack rolls. And you're right. You might need to roll a save or use an action for recall knowledge or some other action in combat. Or you might need to roll a DC5 flat check against concealment, for example. So let me ask you this. Have you ever rolled a perfect nat 20 on your recall knowledge, only to find out there's not too much about this creature that's super helpful, and then you roll a five on your attack? Or what about rolling that nat 20 on the conceal check? You are supposed to do the concealment check first. You roll that nat 20, and then you roll a five on the attack. Or any other combination like that where your good roll is wasted. Let me know about that in the comments. Technically, in those examples, you are rolling on a d20 better than average. You've got a 20 and a 5, that's 25, divided by 2, that's 12.5. But you are not doing better than average. You're missing. You're not feeling great about what your character is doing. What I'm getting at here and how this relates to every plus one matters is I think that all of your careful math-based optimization decisions might not actually change your results all that much. Let's be honest, sometimes you have at the table a super optimized ideal character who's kind of ineffective just due to the dice rolls, at least in a couple of sessions in a row. While on the other hand, you have a completely ridiculous, unoptimized character that just keeps rolling hot and excels in everything that they do. So what should you do about it? I'm not suggesting just building out bad characters. I do believe strongly in optimizing your builds, in using tactics, and doing what you can do to put the math in your favor. If I didn't believe that, I wouldn't have released dozens of videos on those topics. But what I am saying is in this game and in this community, and frankly in life overall, if someone is having a bad experience with something, let's not just point to charts and say, well, that's not true because it is true. They're living it. I am also saying don't sacrifice your enjoyment of the game and of your character and of your cool character ideas for math that has frankly little chance of impacting anything. Go for the feat that you're excited about, not the one that will be used once every three sessions for a conditional plus one that statistically will almost never make a difference. And to kind of conclude these recommendations or sum it up, I think just overall, as a community, maybe we can find a way to keep the crunchiness of the game and of our analysis, but try to take a little bit less robotic, hardline, factual approach to this, you know, fantasy role-playing game. In conclusion, you do want to understand and lean into the math of this game. It is important and you won't have a great time unless you make at least a partial effort to do so. But remember, this is a game and it is a game of chance. There are a lot of outcomes on multiple D20s in a single round of combat. You should build out a decently optimized character, but over the top optimization 
doesn't actually have that much of a chance of actually impacting your gameplay. So don't let it get in the way of having fun. And remember, don't use the math as the ultimate word on how this game should be played and perceived by everyone. Because at the end of the day, we are all just squishy blobs of meat rolling a digital facsimile of an equally weighted icosahedron. So when I roll a one, let me feel bad about it and know that I don't find a chart telling me I'm wrong comforting.